So hello everyone and welcome to the very first um, episode um, of our new webinar series, Digging In with TPS MTSU. Um, for those of you who know us, uh, you know that we've sort of been resistant in years past to doing, um, you know, online uh, workshops, but in this new you know, age and as we're all adapting, we're trying some new things. And so we're really excited about this uh, new series and we really um, are glad you guys are joining us for the very first one. Um, a couple things as we get started. Let's see if my screen will advance. Okay. All right, so a few things. Be sure um, to keep your mics muted. Um, that way we'll just make sure we don't have any background noise that's coming through and distracting anyone. And also if you would, if you will rename yourself, your first and last name. I know sometimes, uh, you know, it comes up as, you know, uh, you know, Jay's device or whatever. So that would just be helpful for us as we do our um, question and answer towards the end. Um, we are going to try to make this as interactive as possible, um, and the three main ways to interact with us are going to be the chat feature, um, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and so I've got instructions there for how to find that. Um, we will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, so feel free to you know, drop thoughts and questions in there. Um, we'll either address those directly in the presentation, in the Q&A, or someone will respond to you as we're going through. Um, also, you have reaction buttons. Uh, there's a hand clap or um, a thumbs up. Be sure to use those too. Um, we'll uh, ask for those occasionally as we're doing things just to um, get some feedback from you guys. Um, and then we are going to be doing a few short polls. Um, and again, this will, um, you know, have some questions for you guys to respond to as we go throughout. Um, and we will be doing a short Q&A session um, at the end of the session and we will be having people to put their questions into the chat box. Um, so again, go through, um, as we're going through the presentations, if you think of a question, go ahead and plug that in there and we'll come back and look at some of those questions at the end of the session. Um, all of the materials and resources used in today's uh, webinar are going to be available on our new Padlet. Um, and we're doing this to try to make things as easy to find um, as possible. So any of the primary sources, the surveys, um, any of that kind of stuff you'll be able to find there. So we've got a link as well as a QR code. Um, we are also, of course, recording this. Uh, we will be posting videos of all of our webinars on our new TPS MTSU YouTube channel um, and have that up and available so that people can watch later on. So if you have to step away or you want to come back and view it later or actually use pieces of it with your students um, next year, you can do so. Um, so with that, I am going to turn things over to my colleague, um, Dr. Graham. Hello. I am going to um, go over just a few minutes the theme for this month's webinar, which of course is the theme for our newsletter for this month, which is Historic Epidemics. And I think we all know why I chose that topic, because it's very timely and connected to current events and connected to your students' lived experiences. And I was just thinking this morning how what you may not be teaching any of these curricular areas right now, but whenever in the future you talk about diseases in your classrooms or libraries, your students are all going to go back to this time in their lives and connect it in some way to their experience. Um, I am going to launch our first poll uh, since we are talking about um, modern uh, experience of disease as much as we are historic. So let me see. I'm going to launch this poll about which of these diseases is there currently uh, no vaccines available? And if you can see that on your screen, if you would all please go ahead and tell me what you think the correct answer is. Out of all these diseases, what can you not get vaccinated for today?
Well, I see that most of you have responded. I think there are a couple people who maybe haven't gotten to this yet or are still thinking about it. Um, and, and so I'm gonna end the poll right now. I see that most of the responses were for malaria. I'm gonna share these responses. And malaria is the correct answer. So congratulations, those of you who uh, chose malaria. Um, malaria is of course still very deadly and contagious and unfortunately common uh, around the world today, maybe not so much in the United States. Um, but there are vaccines available for all these other things. Now, of course, <laughs> we know there's, there's no vaccine available for COVID-19 yet. Um, there are other diseases that there are no vaccines for yet also, such as HIV AIDS um, and dengue fever and other things. Um, but that's something that I, you know, Kira and, and Layla and I, we all learn a lot whenever we do these newsletters. And so we learned a lot about diseases today. Okay, um, I also want to share my screen so I can show you uh, our newsletter. Hold on, this is actually, okay, there we go. So um, our newsletter is, you may have noticed this volume two. That means we have actually done this topic before. Some of you who have been with us for years or who have just browsed our back issues of our newsletters may have noticed that we did this back in August of 2014, uh, where we first chose uh, historic epidemics at a more peaceful time in our world when there were no uh, historic epidemics that we were all living through uh, in, in our memories. Um, so we do have kind of older lesson ideas on the Spanish flu, the Black Death, and yellow fever. Um, we did choose to revisit some of these uh, for this month's newsletter, but I do want to make sure that you can click on that link and, and see that we had these previous lesson ideas. So back to this month. Um, we did, uh, like I said, revisit the Black Death, the influenza pandemic of 1918, because that is something that has been mentioned so many times lately as the um, analogy that's been used most often for talking about coronavirus. So when everybody talks about, oh, we haven't lived through this in the United States for 100 years, of course, they're all referring to this one. And you probably have seen a lot of different articles and things comparing the two pandemics. So we decided to kind of revisit that topic. Um, and then we have new ones we haven't done before uh, yet on typhoid, specifically looking at typhoid Mary and the white plague, which we're gonna delve into in just a couple minutes. And then of course our page four has further resources talking more about vaccines and um, other diseases too, such that we'll talk about a bit more in the resources section later on. Um, but it was a little bit harder for us to connect to the curriculum standards for social studies, which surprisingly to us, barely mention specific diseases. Um, I went through them uh, as much as I could, and I did notice that, of course, the bubonic plague is mentioned specifically in the seventh grade standards, as well as the ancient history standards. And of course, that, that, that should happen. Um, no mention of the 1918 flu at all. Uh, the yellow fever uh, pandemic that, came, that broke out in Memphis uh, was, is in their Tennessee history standards. Let's see. There are a couple of references to outbreaks of diseases um, among Native Americans as part of, you know, white settlement spreading westward and the smallpox uh, decimation of American Indians and uh, Disease being part of the Columbian Exchange, there are, um, there are a couple mentions of AIDS uh, in African American history and in U.S. history. And in current event, uh, current event, I'm sorry, current issues, um, public health uh, disease prevention and research, as well as world epidemics. So we actually milked some contemporary issues standards for this issue, which we don't usually do. But even though these diseases, a lot of them are not 
actually named in your standards. We thought that because this is such a timely subject, uh, it's a really great way to engage the interest of your students because now they can all connect to it through personal experience. So um, it's timely, it's interesting, it's morbid, but uh, unfortunately that kind of helps us through um, our lockdown. Uh, information will help us, I hope. Um, so let's go ahead and take a closer look at one of these major diseases that is still around today, even though it's not in your standards, and that is tuberculosis. So I am going to turn it back over to Kira for a closer look. Thank you, Stacy. Um, so our featured lesson idea uh, for this first webinar is about tuberculosis. Um, so oftentimes tuberculosis, um, you'll find actually referenced by a couple of other names, including um, consumption, um, the white plague, which was not a term I was familiar with before. Um, another term that it can be known by is, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce this, thefus which is from a Greek root, um, and of course consumption actually comes from its Latin root. Um, during the 19th century, um, it was known as a romantic disease, um, and this was actually influenced by a surge in romanticism and by a lot of the pop culture during the time. Um, and speaking of pop culture, I want you guys to think about where are some pop culture references for um, TV that you're familiar with. Um, so think about you know, movies, TV shows, books, um, characters that had um, TB in them. So in the chat box, if you would kind of make, uh, add in some thoughts there real quick. So there's Mask of the Red Death. That's All right, and I can't see the chat at the moment, so. Um, yeah. Layla. Can you hear me? Yeah. So we have Mask of the Red Death, um, Doc from Tombstone. Somebody else said Tombstone. Let's see. Those are the only three we have right now. Okay. So oh, I found one. When a character coughs and there's blood in the handkerchief, it means he's going to die. There was a character on Penny Dreadful with um, tuberculosis. I feel that there are a lot of subtle references in movies, um, Savannah said. So a lot of different things coming in now. And actually the comment about, you know, there's always that emphasis think of in movies or TV shows where you do have the character who, you know, you know, is takes this coughing fit and is coughing into their, you know, their handkerchief and, you know, they pull it away and all of a sudden you see this like bloody cough and you know, at that point, that character is going to die. Um, nothing good is gonna happen for that character. Um, so a couple of ones that pop into my mind that I'm most familiar with, uh, you guys mentioned Tombstone, of course, uh, Val Kilmer is Doc Holliday in that infamous role, um, playing, of course, the, you know, as he suffered and died from TB during the movie. Um, and Moulin Rouge, uh, Nicole Kidman's character, of course, um, suffers from tuberculosis. Um, there is uh, also a video game, um, which I'm not familiar with this one as I'm not a, a huge video game player myself, but Red Dead Redemption 2, which some of your students may be familiar with, actually has a character in the story there who suffers from TB. Um, and George Orwell, of course, author of 1984, um, he actually also suffered from TB um, during the course of his life. Um, so we have a poll. I want you guys to think about, let's see. Let me get back to our, so I want you to answer this question. Who is thought to have been infected with tuberculosis? And you can choose more than one. Um, so if you would kind of go through there and click all of the ones that you think may have suffered from tuberculosis. Um, so some possible thing, uh, possible choices include Eleanor Roosevelt, Charles Hamilton Houston, Andrew Jackson, Robert Burns, John Keats, Sir Walter Scott, Voltaire, Walt Whitman, John Calvin, and Louis VIII of France. So I'll give you guys a minute to kind of respond to that. Remember, you can pick more than one.
All right, most of you guys have had a chance to respond, so we're going to end the poll and I will share those results with you. So we see it's kind of Walt Whitman was in the lead here. Um, the correct answer here is actually all of the above. Um, all of these people are believed to have suffered from tuberculosis during the course of their life. So with that in mind, some things that your students may not know about tuberculosis. Um, first off, it was one of the most feared diseases in the world, um, especially during the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Um, it actually um, dates back as far as 9,000 years in humans, um, although there is, uh, it looks to be some discussion, some debate about that, but there has been um, some human skeletal remains that were found that were shown to um, have the bacteria um, for uh, tuberculosis, so that's why they dated it back 9,000 years. Um, it is an airborne disease that passes from person to person um, and is characterized largely by um, a, a bloody cough or um, a cough, like a hacking cough, that sometimes there can be a little bit uh, a thick white film that comes up before you get to the bloody portion, um, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss. Um, between 1600 and 1800, um, TB actually accounted for 25% of all deaths in Europe and the United States. Um, and in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was actually the leading cause of death um, in the US. Um, so really, this is why it has that reputation of being one of the most feared diseases. Um, it primarily impacted cities, of course, because of crowded um, and filthy living conditions during the time period. Um, and the urban poor were most often um, the victims um, of this disease. Again, just thinking about um, how closely they would have lived together in the sanitation conditions of uh, the more impoverished neighborhoods. Well, all right, there we go. So for a long time, um, it really wasn't under, much understood about tuberculosis. In fact, for a long time, it was thought to be a hereditary disease. Um, people did not understand um, you know, how, what caused it, how it was passed. Um, and it really isn't until the mid to late 1800s that there starts to be some scientific advancements to help us understand the disease. Um, in fact, um, the Frenchman, and again, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, French is not my language, um, Jean-Antoine Villeman, um, he actually is the one who discovered that it was a contagious disease and not hereditary. He made that discovery in 1868 um, and was able to prove that. Of course, not everyone believed him and believed his findings, um, and it really isn't until uh, about 1882 when German microbiologist Robert Koch um, is actually able to isolate the causative agent for tuberculosis, um, and that causative agent is actually a mycobacterium tuberculosis or tubular bacillus. Um, and when he is able to make this discovery, what he finds out is that a single cough from an infected person has hundreds of the bacilli that's going to then possibly infect others. So one cough has the potential to infect many other people. Um, and understanding that really begins to change how um, society is able to uh, come up with ideas for treating and actually preventing tuberculosis. Um, and so in the late 1800s, again, moving into the 1900s, we see two things happen that really start to you know, improve chances for fighting this disease. Uh, one is uh, understanding how to treat people who actually have the disease. So knowing that it's contagious, um, we know that we need to separate sick people from healthy people. And so you actually have a, a, sen a senatorium uh, movement that begins during that time period. And you know, part of the reason again was you, know, you wanted to separate the sick from the healthy, but the other thought was that the best ways to treat the disease was actually to get people out into the countryside where there was fresh air and they could get lots of physical exercise outdoors and also improve their diet. Um, that was really thought to be some of the best ways to treat um, tuberculosis. Um, the very first uh, sanatorium that was founded was actually in the Adirondacks, uh, which is pictured here. Um, and that was in 1885. Um, and you'll note here this image, um, this looks like a, a really nice vacation resort. Um, so it's very uh, lovely buildings. Um, and so we see that's the first one. Um, by 1904, there are about 100 across the United States. Now, remember, of course, with the sanatoriums, um, you're going to have some that are going to be catering to the wealthy. 
Um, and so probably places like the one picture here. Um, and then you also will have some of uh, the first uh, sanatorium uh, that treated TB patients for African Americans was actually in Virginia. So even with this movement, of course, you also have to factor in um, class and um, segregation. The other thing that happens during the period is, again, thinking about how we're going to prevent the spread of TB. Um, and so there's several public health campaigns that get started. Um, and one of those uh, you may have actually heard of, but not realized that it was part of the TB, uh, the fight against TB, and that is anti-spitting. Using your uh, reaction uh, buttons, if you want a thumbs up, how many of you guys have heard of places that have laws where it's illegal to spit on the sidewalk? So again, using your thumbs up, you guys have heard of those laws before? You know, a few years ago, I was watching something and they were talking about, uh, you know, kind of odd laws that uh, are around. And, and I heard that one mentioned, that was one that was always brought up. And I never realized that that is actually because uh, of campaigns to stop TB. Um, the other thing uh, that happened is women's fashion actually started to change. Um, and so uh, hem lines on dresses got to be a tiny bit shorter um, and so that you didn't have fabric that is dragging the ground. Um, and this kind of goes into context with the anti-spitting campaigns because if people who are sick are spitting onto the sidewalk. And remember with every cough, you have hundreds of bacilli that are coming out. So you would just have like, again, TB cough phlegm everywhere. Um, and so you didn't want women, of course, dragging their long skirts through the, you know, through the streets um, and in, you know, inside buildings um, and kind of picking up this bacteria and then possibly taking it home and infecting their families. Um, and so both of those things happen kind of simultaneously, um, and that actually um, helps to prevent some TB. Uh, other public health campaigns during the time promoted good hygiene, um, exercise, um, proper sleep, um, and a proper diet. Um, and by 1921, we actually start to have some vaccines developed. Uh, there is the BCG vaccine, uh, which is shown to be somewhat effective. Um, and then there's a number of antibiotics that are developed that are able to um, actually treat tuberculosis. And so that we find by the mid to late 1900s, um, the rate for tuberculosis has drastically increased to what it was um, in the decades previous. Um, and of course today the disease is still around um, and one of the concerns today of course are drug resistant strains of TB. Now, if you're looking for some additional resources um, for uh, kind of understanding the background of tuberculosis and how it impacted um, societies, um, I found three that I used in researching um, this month's lesson idea. Um, the first one is a documentary from PBS called The Forgotten Plague. Um, and we've got the link here. Um, the Center for Disease Control um, has some information on World TB Day um, and has a history of tuberculosis on there. And then the American Lung Association has an exhibit that is actually uh, utilized as a resource in the lesson idea in this month's newsletter. Um, a fun fact that I didn't know, um, the American Lung Association actually gets started um, as a group that was working to, um, to prevent and eradicate TB. Um, and it's really through that work that it later kind of evolves into the American Lung Association. Um, so that I thought was interesting. So for um, the lesson idea for this month, we really looked at some of the public health campaigns um, to prevent TB. And so we looked at a series of posters. Um, and with each of these posters, we're going to think about, and what, you would what we hope you would do with students, is think about what they are promoting in these posters to prevent tuberculosis. Um, so this one right here, we see it says, fight tuberculosis, obey the rules of health. Um, so we see it features um, a sunshine, so again, the outdoors. Uh, we have fruits here, so that proper diet. Uh, we have a glass of liquid here, so hydration. The lady is sleeping, so proper sleep and rest. Um, and we see, of course, that is all hopeful um, to prevent and, and make sure someone is healthy enough to fight off the disease. The next series um, I like because you have an image as well as you have uh, a little bit of text that you could use with students. So this first one here says the tuberculosis family. Um, and we see the lady holding a small child. It says, children do not inherit consumption, but almost always acquire it if kept with infected parents. The children of consumptives should be nursed by a healthy wet nurse or brought up on the bottle away from the mother. Should be kept away from, the per from tuberculosis people 
and should be examined by a doctor every six months. So a couple of things here we would want to note with our students. Uh, one, we see, again, multiple names that the disease is known by, tuberculosis and consumption. Uh, we see, again, that they're understanding that it is a contagious disease, and so, again, wanting to separate the sick from the healthy. Um, and again, especially thinking about small children, um, and that if a mother is infected, that if she is caring um, for that child, that child is going to get um, TB. And so here are some ways to prote protect, um, you know, especially infants. The next one, tuberculosis is a house disease. Uh, we see what looks to be a Native American man sitting in a canoe. Um, and it says, man is naturally an outdoor animal. Keep the children outdoors. By day, let them work, play, and study outdoors. By night, let them sleep on a sheltered screen porch. Bring outdoors indoors by keeping windows open, top and bottom, day and night. He who lets in the air and sunshine shuts out the doctor. So again, some things here we would want to note with our students um, that the emphasis on fresh air and being outdoors and sunshine. Um, and so you know, it's mentioned that you know, man is naturally out, you know, an outdoor animal, um, you know, having children, being active and playing outside. Um, what's really interesting is this idea of sleeping outside. Um, some of you guys uh, may uh, you know, remember you know, parents, grandparents, great grandparents who might have had uh, sleeping porches on their homes. Um, and so that kind of connects back to that thought there, um, and being able to get out where there's fresh air. And especially we think back to these generations where you had large families who might have shared smaller living quarters, where you would have had six or seven people possibly sharing a bedroom. You would want to be somewhere that's well ventilated um, to, of course, hopefully prevent a disease spread. The next poster, Fighting Tuberculosis in the School, have all children regularly examined by a school doctor. Banish the tuberculosis teacher. Transfer tuberculosis children to special institutions. Provide open air classes for sickly children and those from tuberculosis homes. Send a school nurse to visit the homes and keep schools clean, airy, and cool. Teach the rules of hygienic living. So some things here we see, of course, again, being able to separate the sick from the healthy taking the, you know, the sick teachers out of the school, taking sick children, um, removing those from the healthy children so we're not spreading uh, the disease within school buildings. Um, I think it's interesting here, the emphasis on um, healthcare that's provided directly within the schools, um, that there's a school doctor, um, and that we're actually promoting sending school nurses out to visit the homes. Um, I would be interested to know um, how widely available that was, um, because as we know now, not all schools have the same resources, so um, just how uh, widely available was it that school nurses could go out um, to visit homes and provide some suggestions for how to impre uh, in increase the health of the family. Um, and again, this idea, this emphasis on teaching the rules of hygienic li living, um, the emphasis on uh, you know, proper diet, proper exercise, proper sleep. Food and tuberculosis. Children's fight Children fight life's battles on their stomachs. Good food is their ammunition. Children need plenty of milk, eggs, cereal, fruit, green vegetables, and whole wheat bread and butter, or o margarine. Avoid fried food, pickles, spices, pastry, tea and coffee, wine, beer, too much meat and sweets. Milk is the most valuable, but most easily infected of foods. Therefore, give only pasteurized milk or boil the milk in the home. So a couple of things here that I thought are interesting that you would want to point out to students, again, this emphasis on teaching people proper nutrition, uh, so the things that we should be eating to have a balanced diet, um, and the importance of that, especially for children, to grow up healthy and strong um, and develop their immune systems. And you might bring into this point here with your students um, just how um, high the mortality rate was for small children. Um, and so again, the emphasis on wanting to you know, help our kids to be healthy and strong so that they can survive those childhood diseases to make it uh, into adulthood. Um, they might find it interesting that we're saying here uh, to avoid wine and beer with small children. Um, how you know, common was that? Uh, that might definitely pop up for our kids. Um, and then the other thing that you might wanna bring up, of course, is what they're saying here about milk. Um, you know, milk is valuable, but it's easily infected. Um, and so you might talk about why that is. Um, how, you know, what was the process of procuring milk? 
storing milk um, and you know how it was you know people purchased it and so actually understanding that process um, that's going to be something very different than what our students are used to now. And the final poster, uh, tuberculosis. Um, we see the picture of the small child here and it says, don't kiss me, your kiss of affection, the germs of infection. Um, and of course, this gets back to that idea of just how highly contagious TB was. Um, and so if you had someone who was sick with TB and they kissed a small child, and of course we think about how, you know, small children don't have the most highly developed immune systems, odds are those kids would get sick. Um, and of course, this is really relevant. We see lots of uh, promotion every year now um, during cold and flu season about the importance of protecting small children from, of course, the cold, flu, and RSV. Um, and so, and that gets back to the same concept that we see here in this public health campaign poster. So thinking about um, these posters, uh, I've got a poll question for you. I want you guys um, thinking about these. Which one is your favorite? So I'm gonna launch a poll here. Of these, which one is your favorite? All right, we see just about everybody has responded. And it's pretty, pretty widely spread out. So. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll. And so the winner um, by a small margin was the final poster there with the small kid, Don't Kiss Me. Um, in second place, the very first poster, Obey the Rules of Health, um, and then with, uh, the TB family and TB in the schools as the next two. So thinking about these posters, some things that you could do with your students. Um, you know, you would want to have them think about how these posters uh, collectively fit into that larger public health campaign to prevent the spread of tuberculosis. Um, you might have them, again, go through, analyze, think about the key things that we're finding in each one of these. Um, you I could also have them compare um, these posters to some modern public health campaign pieces. And of course, right now in the midst of the COVID-19, um, you know, epidemic, uh, we see lots of public health campaign posters, uh, posters, commercials, social media pieces. Um, so students are going to be really, um, you know, very cognizant of all the things they're seeing around them. Have them compare the two. Think about how they're effective, what are some common themes that we're seeing presented in these, um, and how they compare and how effective they might be. Um, and to end, um, you know, after you've went through and done the analysis activity, if you wanted to uh, come with kind of a cool reflection activity with your students, you could think about having your kids create their own public health campaign, either one related to tuberculosis, um, or have them create something to kind of go along with what we're all experiencing right now with COVID-19. Um, you could have them do short videos. Um, and I've heard a lot of people who are doing online learning right now talking about how much their kids enjoy doing like the short little videos. Um, have them do skits if you're back in the class. And you know, just think about kind of fun ways that kids could uh, create that. So with that said, we hope you guys um, you know, can find some useful things and, and really um, hopefully learn a few things about tuberculosis. Like I said, when we started this one, I uh, was amazed at how little I had understood about its uh, long-term impacts um, and just how prevalent it was. Um, so hopefully this will be something that your students will find interesting. So with that, I am going to stop sharing um, and we're gonna turn it over to Layla, who's gonna talk to us about some highlighted primary sources. Hopefully, Layla's been having some tech problems. Okay, good. I got like the little wheel spinning for a second, but I think I'm good. Um, shouldn't have done my updates last night. It's messed everything up. All right, let's see. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Okay. Oh no. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Perfect. Okay, good. I got the little wheel again. I got kind of scared. All right. So, um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. 
reaction, something like that. Perfect. All right, so um, I'm going to be walking you through a few resources we used in the newsletter from Chronicling America. Um, Chronicling America is a great resource available through the Library of Congress, um, but it can be kind of hard to search through. So um, hopefully these tricks and resources um, we're showing you today will make using Chronicling America a little bit easier. So first, we're going to start by going to the Library of Congress homepage, this loc.gov page right here. And next, we're going to scroll down to the Researchers tab right here. I'm going to click on that. And then we're going to go down on this page a little bit and go to Newspaper and Current Periodical. Let me click on that again. There we go. Perfect. And then you'll see right here Topics in Chronicling America. So I'm going to click right there on Topics. And then Topics in Chronicling America, you can do a few different options. You can go alphabetical, subject category, or by date range. We're going to go by subject category today, just so you can see everything um, that's available. So there are a lot of options here. If we scroll through, it takes us a minute to get through everything. Um, you can either scroll through and click on the link that you want specifically going through um, topic, or you can look at the hyperlinked menu up at the top and go from there. So where we're gonna go today is natural wonders and disasters in the environment. So let me click right there. Oh, okay. Do you guys see my frozen computer? Yeah, okay, just wanted to make sure. Let me just give it a minute. She's being a little finicky today. Okay, here we go. So we're now at Natural Wonders, Disasters, and, um, and the Environment. So I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit, if it'll let me. I'm not seeing it right now, but you're not. I'll be patient. You do have a Mac. Yes, uh, please be patient. Do you see it now? If you want, Layla, I can do some navigating for you while you speak. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. All right. I am going to go to it, that toolbar on top blocks my tabs, so that's kind of annoying. Um, all right, so the way that can everyone see what I have now? Okay, so Layla, narrate. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay, so go to that topics in Chronicling America and then go to subject category right there. All right, and just click on the tab that's hyperlinked at the top, um, the natural wonders, disasters, and the environment category. And we're gonna go down to um, tuberculosis first, since that was what our fantastic lesson idea feature was from today. Okay, so um, here at the top, you see a brief little blurb or summary about tuberculosis. This is a great refresher for background information, um, just to get you in the right mindset. You'll also see an important dates tab there. Um, that's really helpful because when using Chronicling America, you can select specific date parameters. Um, so this timeline is going to really help you decide how to narrow down and um, really make your search specific. Um, the suggested search strategies are also an important feature. Um, it provides you with search terms that you can use while um, researching a topic in Chronicling America. So um, one of the terms um, that I thought was really interesting is consumptive beauty. If you've heard of that, um, I really would never think to search consumptive beauty when thinking about tuberculosis. Um, but consumptive beauty is a term, it, 17th, 18th century people, like Kira in, uh, mentioned earlier, they kind of romanticize the symptoms and the physical look of tuberculosis. So consumptive beauty, when you type that into your search bar 
on Google, you're going to get a ton of interesting stuff as well as in Chronicling America. Um, the thinness, the pale skin that made your veins pop out, your rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes, your red lips, those are actually all signs of a constant low-grade fever, but those were considered beautiful, um, the ideal beauty for a proper lady at the time and the appearance that they would have on their deathbed when dying from tuberculosis. So it's interesting to see that term there. Um, other diseases that we didn't talk about in this lesson idea, like smallpox or cholera, were much more gruesome and disfiguring and nowhere near as um, beautiful or romantic as dying from tuberculosis or consumption. So I have a link I'll drop in our chat box at the end of this, and you can see an example of the romanticization, romanticization of um, tuberculosis at the time. I think it's from 1810, so I'll drop that there. But that search term gave me a lot of interesting stuff, just thinking of consumptive beauty. Um, so one thing you can also see underneath the suggested search strategies, there are sample articles from Chronicling America. These are fantastic. If you don't know exactly what you're even looking for, but you have this topic, you can go in and look through these articles and see specifically, or see specific items for the topic. So the one from the Herald, I think it's the third one down, Dr. Graham, consumption. Yes, so, and this cool thing about Chronicling America, it's going to highlight in red the word that you're looking for, the search word that you're looking for. So consumption, and you see it says, of the human race, one man in seven tainted with this disease, a statement of its principal cause. And this, I think, is from 18, is it 1898? Yeah, perfect. So 1898 from California. And there, this is kind of when that romanticism has shifted. And now they're starting to see consumption or tuberculosis as a disease of the poor, like those um, posters that Kira showed us. So we're seeing this shift in public perception as you look at the differences in the newspaper articles in the years. So here you see consumption is highlighted in red. Every single time it's written in the article, you're gonna see it highlighted, which makes it so much easier um, when searching because you don't see this massive sea of text. You see a red word and you know exactly where to go. It makes it a lot easier. And up at the top of the page, Dr. Graham, can you scroll up please? To the top of the like search bar. Wait, what? The what, this one right here? Oh, Layla, you froze. Kira, do you know where I'm supposed to go? <laughs> so I think she was talking about the top of the, um, the article there. Oh, the, this? Yeah, I think that's what she was referring to. She said like search bar. Oh, we're having yeah, difficulty. I think, I think Layla like froze up again. So um, Stacey, do you want to kind of point out some of the other things that she yeah, yeah. I'm, I have a portion where I was going to talk about some additional resources as well. So I will just kind of fill you in on some of those and we'll come back uh, to revisit these Chronicling America resources if Layla's computer behaves. Um, basically, uh, I wanted to just mention, as I'm sure you all know from doing any kind of work, that you always look up more things and find more things than you can fit in the final product. And so that happens every time we do a newsletter. Um, uh, so of course there are uh, additional resources and links that we found, but I did wanna just kind of highlight some of the ones uh, that you may not be as likely to click on in here, uh, our most recent newsletter. For one thing, uh, Here's another example of a poster. Uh, I know that we, we saw the ones on tuberculosis. The, um, the New Deal uh, had a lot of different public health campaigns that it was promoting uh, for various diseases. And so you can actually find posters about other diseases in the exact same collection. Some like this one are just kind of general public sanitation. Um, and uh, there's 
couple great ones with pictures of mosquitoes or um, tenements that were kind of considered to be slums and how you clean those out and one with brushing your teeth. This is great for hand washing, as you can see. Uh, they all had kind of, I guess at the time, what was considered cutting edge graphics, which is interesting to talk about from an aesthetic point of view. Um, there were lots of posters about STDs, uh, so the campaign against syphilis, which you probably don't wanna talk about with your students, but which of course has been uh, you know, an epidemic in lots of places around the world. Um, so there's lots of, if you like those posters there, you can find some for other topics as well. Um, our important links box, which is always to be found on page two, has some things that uh, maybe we couldn't delve as much into uh, in some of our lesson ideas. Um, the Black Death, not so well represented through Library of Congress sources, um, but uh, it links to a, a new website, Middle Ages for Educators. So those seventh grade teachers that you know that are always looking for things, this is a new resource for them. Um, there's a great lesson idea on the Black Death from the Stanford History Education Group, um, which of course are uh, TPS partners out of Stanford who do the Reading Like a Historian website. Uh, I mentioned how back in our August 2014 newsletter, we did uh, a lesson idea on yellow fever and how yellow fever is actually one of the very few specific diseases mentioned in social studies standards because of its impact on Tennessee in the 19th century. We have a great lesson plan that looks at the aftermath of that um, epidemic in Memphis and how it is that you rebuild after such a uh, loss of life and you know as we think about how we're going to rebuild our economy and our social structures this might be something that you can draw parallels to and still hit some curriculum standards um i also wanted to highlight that something that kira also mentioned which uh oh goodness where it is? Okay, here it is. Um, the American Experience videos on the PBS website. I'm sure that many of you are familiar or have watched these on TV. They are great and uh, their documentaries are always very well done. And in addition to tuberculosis ones, I'm just going up in the search box right up here, they have one on uh, the great flu of uh, 1918 which of course has been probably passed around in social media a lot lately. A lot of articles and timelines and video clips as well as the documentaries as a whole. They also have programs for um, the yellow fever. Uh, and so which they call the great fever. So that's another resource you could use for teaching that topic. And uh, I also found some stuff on polio through the American Experience website too. So you can see they even have this little article talking about how Candyland, which is a game that I used to love playing when I was a little kid, was developed to amuse the kids in these polio wards and hospitals in 1940s. So um, it's got a little video clip that goes along with that. So that might be something that might interest uh, your younger students. Okay, I'm getting really annoyed with this share bar just blocking all of my tabs. Um, I think I'm going to, ooh, I think I'm going to make my screen a little bit tinier so that I can reach my tabs even when that share bar, okay. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, there we go. Um, so other things I wanted to point out Okay, so this is in the August 2014 newsletter, uh, the iron lung image uh, talking about polio. Um, this is from the Carol Highsmith photograph collection, which are really great because they're beautiful full color photos and they're um, more recent, uh, but they're all in the public domain, which is really rare for recent photographs at the Library of Congress website. And she also has a whole series of photographs taken from this little town in Georgia where FDR went when he was convalescing from polio. 
Um, he was actually one of the rare people who contracted the disease when he was an adult. He was like 39 years old. And of course, the fact that the President of the United States had had it meant that there was a lot of public attention to fighting this disease. And so you can also see on our newsletter for this month, there is this really great public service announcement called Time Out for Margaret. And this actually links to a really cool blog article at the Library of Congress. Okay, if I can get it to come up. Please don't tell me that the Library of Congress, okay, here we go. When polio was defeated by a vaccine and a seven-year-old girl, um, this was written by someone at the Library of Congress whose aunt had polio. And so here's a picture of his aunt. And this is, um, it was actually called infantile paralysis. So here's another case where if you're searching for this among historic newspapers, you probably need to use a different term that we don't really use anymore. And that was the infantile paralysis. And so here we have Margaret O'Brien, which who was a very popular child actress at the time, uh, just doing a PSA on the fight for polio and it would show in theaters. And of course this led to the, the March of Dimes uh, which is still around today. Um, and of course, this was something that was, the, the vaccine was finally developed by Jonas Salk. Um, but when the vaccine first came out, it actually had some bad, re bad, bad side effects. And they were kind of, um, it really shook public confidence. And so in order to get people to feel confident enough to actually, you know, once they tweak the vaccine to make it safer, uh, they came out with a special report on polio. So here's 15 minutes of the Surgeon General of the United States talking about the efficacy of a, of a vaccine, which is, you know, I, I can't imagine um, that kind of thing happening today, at least not for 15 minutes, um, where they would expect people to actually listen that long to a public official talk about health. Um, we probably would have a three minute clip right today. Um, but here it is, I, probably not something that your students would wanna sit all the way through, but it's interesting to see how they decided to explain it to the public, because of course explaining public health issues to the public is always a challenge. And that of course is something that we are all living through right now. Layla, are you back? because um, I am happy to yeah, I had to change the back computers. over to you. I was filling in as you were all frozen. I so. appreciate it. I just gave up, closed that computer, and went and got the other one. Well, uh, I, I will stop sharing if you'd like to, to, to share, or if you want, I can go back to the screen that we were on before. I still have it up. I can probably do it now. I just had to download Zoom onto my other computer, so it took a minute. Okay, so I will stop sharing right now. And that was just an overview of some additional resources. And if anyone has anything you want to add to that, drop it in the chat box. And of course, you can always email us afterwards. So I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. All right, guys, thanks for hanging with me through that. That was a little wild. Um, so like I said, on Chronicling America, you have these important dates. It's super important um, to look at these dates, kind of narrow down your search because it's going to tell you key times when this is being reported in the news. And again, like I said, you can see how public perception kind of shifts um, with tuberculosis or with, for example, typhoid, anything like that, um, as it's seen as a disease that everybody's getting to a disease that just the poor people in the communities, the poor neighborhoods, the impoverished areas are um, falling victim to. So you see differences there. Um, I mentioned consumptive beauty. I'm going to drop in um, the chat box, if I can, a little link. Hmm. I don't know if I can if I'm the person sharing my screen, but I'll drop it after we finish. So again, you have your suggested search strategies, your sample articles. Um, and the cool thing about Chronicling America that I was explaining, you can search by state. So if there's a specific state you want to look at and look at the newspaper articles from, you can do that. You also can narrow down the years and using that Chronicling America topics in Chronicling America will really help you narrow down the dates and it goes all the way up to 1963. 
And then you can use these little pieces here to type in what you're looking for. Um, and using these suggested search terms um, through the topics in Chronicling America is always helpful. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you guys, because our newsletter wasn't just on tuberculosis, we had different diseases as well. There is um, a section in topics in Chronicling America on the um, influenza of 1918. And you'll see you have your blurb again, you have a really brief timeline here, and then you have a cool uh, cartoon you can click to learn more about it or read more about it. And you have your strategies and selected articles once again, and a ton of different selected articles here that you can search through to find more information about the influenza of 1918. Um, and then also in our newsletter we had, and this is actually part of the, um, the newsletter lesson activity on typhoid. So typhoid, Mary, I saw um, Dr. Van Zelm, you talk, talked about, um, Typhoid Mary and how she was in prison, but she was not the only person who was infecting people. So this topics in Chronicling America on Typhoid Mary, you have your important dates here to search and you also have sample articles. Woman at Typhoid Factory held as prisoner and we see the shift in public perception how they view Mary as a victim. And then when she gets arrested a second time for being a cook, she's kind of like, oh, She's going to be held prisoner now and nobody feels sorry for her. So you see the progression and change in public perception in these articles as well. And it also, before I did any research on this, I didn't know that Typhoid Mary had two different names. She went by Mary Mallon and Mary Alverson. So very interesting to see how you can search for her and find more information. Um, and then there are also um, Chronicling America, Topics in Chronicling America also has a section on um, the bubonic plague in Chinatown. So we did a lesson activity on the bubonic plague and this just shows you, uh, I'm sure Dr. Graham told you, um, that the bubonic plague is still happening today or still happening in history. So this is 19, 1899 to 1920. So still very relevant, not something that happened hundreds of years ago. Oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot to oh, mention okay. that actually. You can, Sorry. If you, if you go to Arizona, be stay away from the squirrels. They still carry the plague out there. You can look, read it about it on the CDC. All right, there's my PR. <laughs> so um, each section that I just talked about and each section and topics is going to have brief summary for backgrounds, a timeline of events, and sample articles for searching Chronicling America. So like I said before, Chronicling America can be a little confusing to navigate, um, but I hope some of these tips like the date parameters, the state, using the specific search words, things like that will make your lives a little bit easier. Um, so I think, am I gonna turn it back to Dr. Graham now that you've done resources or? We'll you? turn it back to Kira uh, for okay. Q&A. Okay. Okay. Right, so if you guys have any questions that haven't already been addressed in the chat, if you guys want to go ahead and kind of be writing those in, we'll take a couple questions here before we wrap up. Um, so it's really, I hope you guys have found some interesting information as we've been going through. I saw lots of really cool comments about things you guys have seen lately. Um, you know, as we've seen different uh, media articles talking about uh, pandemics um, in years past. So we have anybody who has any questions. There's actually an article for the cartoon I'll link in there as well. You were muted, Layla, but she said that there's an article that goes along with that cartoon and she's going to link to that as well. How did you know? You're so good. All right, I'm not seeing any questions pop up. So again, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes if you have questions while we're doing that. I'm going to share with you just a uh, last couple things that we'll do is wrap up here um, for our very first webinar. Again, thank you guys for um, joining us today. Um, not what I um, just a quick reminder, um, again, that all of the, the resources referenced today will be available in one place, and this will include a link to the, uh, the video once we have it posted to YouTube. Um, that's going to be on our Padlet, um, and you can find that address here, padlet.com. Uh, slash TPS underscore MTSU. Um, all of the, again, uh, all the materials, the PowerPoints, all those things will be up and available there. Um, we also, 
Uh, all right. Um, we will be doing participation certificates uh, for everyone who has participated with us today or for those of you who might be viewing this after the fact, you can still get a participation certificate. Um, you will need to fill out a, a short survey. Uh, we've got a Google form. Um, Layla, you or Stacy one, if you can drop that in the link into the chat box so people can easily kind of link to it. Right. Um, for those of you who might be viewing this after the fact, um, if you just want to um, write out the, the shortened, um, for sure, the shortest URL I could get, um, but this will take you to our short survey for you to complete. Um, once we get that, we will generate a participation certificate and email that to you um, so that you can turn that in for one hour of PD credit. Um, we will be doing these uh, webinars once a month uh, and we'll again be doing them uh, related to our newsletter theme each month. So if you have suggestions for uh, themes you would like to see us do in the future, um, please let us know. Um, and again, because this is something new that we're trying, um, we would love your feedback, um, thoughts on ways that we can make these um, as interesting and engaging as possible. Um, we've all sat through um, some of some not great webinars, I'm sure, um, but we would want to make sure that ours um, can be as engaging as possible. So again, we would love your feedback. Um, you can uh, put that stuff into the, the feedback form there, um, or feel free to email um, either um, Stacy or myself. Um, we would be happy and would love to hear from you. And if there are, I don't think we had any questions. So that concludes our very first webinar. Um, so again, thank you guys for joining us for digging in with TPS MTSU. Um, we will be back next month um, and our theme for next month is music. Um, so we will be looking at uh, different um, lesson ideas, contents, resources, um, and highlighted primary sources related to teaching music. Um, and we're looking at uh, Tennessee specific music uh, resources. So that should be hopefully a fun topic to explore for the month of June. So again, thank you guys for joining us. We're going to stop recording.